Okay, so hello everyone. Greetings from Geneva. My name is Emilia Larson, and I'm the officer in charge of the UN Environment Ultra Joint Unit, uh, and we're, I'm here joining you today for the UNDAC talk. And as you know, this lecture series is really aimed to tap into the great expertise and, and experience that we have within the UNDAC system, and to help maintain and reinforce the UNDAC system as a center of excellence. Uh, so today we're here to talk about disaster waste. Uh, as you may know, waste generated by disaster is a major challenge in emergency operations. In the first phases, of course, it slows down delivery of aid. It also hinders access. But also in the long run, it poses a risk to, to safety and health. And with us today, as an uh, expert on, on this topic on disaster waste, is Camilla Andersson from the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency. And she's here to share her perspectives on the role in the UNDAC team of, of addressing this particular challenge. Um, so she also has time. She has, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a talk together, uh, Camilla and I. And then after that, uh, we, we're going to ask some questions. So please jot them down as, as we're going along. So hello, Camilla. Welcome to the UNDAC talk. Hello, Amelia. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you with us today. So I know you personally already for some years. We've been working together, and I know that you're very passionate about uh, about the topic of, of waste management, and that you have some ideas on how we can better address this in the early phases of, of response. And uh, MNB is, of course, also one of the key partners of the joint unit, and just uh, of, of way in ways of, of introduction, a couple of, of words on on our joint partnership. Uh, so. The, the joint unit is, of course, also quite familiar in working with disaster waste uh, as it's a cross-cutting issue, and, and the unit itself was set up over 20 years ago to, to work in the interface between environment and humanitarian assistance. Uh, and MSB, if we look at the past mission statistics, uh, MSB has also been one of our core partners, um, uh, participating in around 30% of our missions from the, from the past uh, over the past 20 years, uh, and also uh, going into some specific missions related to disaster waste, uh, we of course deploy jointly to Ghana. Uh, so that's the first picture you see there for the flooding in Accra in, in 2011. We had a Swedish expert go out and look at waste management. Also the, the Philippine Bohol earthquake in 2013, we had one of, of your experts uh, deploy and then, of course, uh, usually we do send uh, environmental experts as part of, of the UNDAC teams, and they are also looking at disaster waste. So, for example, we had in Ecuador, we had a person uh, deploying as part of the UNDAC team looking at disaster waste. And also looking at the next slide and the pictures there, uh, then we had uh, a person going from uh, MSB to Jordan as an environmental field advisor through the standby partnership program. So indeed, our partnership goes way back, and we have worked on a lot of, of uh, missions together, Camilla. Isn't that right? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Amelia. And uh, yeah, we do indeed appreciate our partnership that uh, actually stands back uh, even longer back in time. As uh, it all uh, started in 2005 after the Kashmir earthquake in Pakistan, where MSP, or actually rather our predecessor, the Swedish Rescue Services Agency, um, we received a request from you from Joint Environmental Unit uh, to the rapid assessment and to work with debris, rubble, and hospital healthcare waste around all the humanitarian hubs uh, in their affected areas. And uh, back then, uh, we were together with the Swiss Agency for Development, one of the few, or if not the only, humanitarian actors with the capacity to handle environmental consequences in humanitarian uh, emergencies. Uh, so it was agreed that uh, the two agencies uh, would uh, initiate a mission together. Uh, so we took off to Kashmir jointly with the Swiss Development Agency. Um, so that was the first uh, request uh, that we had. And the last one was actually just recently, resulting in that my colleague, Leif Jensen, was deployed as an environmental expert to the UNDER team uh, to assess the impact of the flash floods in Sierra Leone. And he should be on his way back any day now. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, our partnership is actually more than that. We do a lot of proactive work together, too. And uh, later this month, we are, for example, jointly engaging in the environment in, in the emergency forum in Nairobi. 
uh, where one of the sessions will also be in the staff waste management. So we look forward to that. Yeah, that's right. So indeed, we don't work only on response, but also look at preparedness. And, and MSB was, of course, also instrumental in, in developing the disaster waste management guidelines and setting up the Environmental Emergencies uh, Center, where we also have an online course available in, in four languages on disaster waste management, which is free and accessible to, to everyone. Uh, so, so it's, of course, much more, much more than, than response. Uh, but still, I mean, looking still from the from the perspective of the of the ANDAC members, can you can you tell me how it emerged? You know that that MSB would be active also in this uh, area. Um, well, uh, to start with, we we started engaging in humanitarian response in general in 1988 uh, when we sent a team of first responders to support rescue work after the Armenian earthquake that claimed 30,000 people's lives. And uh, since then, we have, uh, apart from participating in missions, uh, first responders expanded our technical capacity significantly. And we have uh, since then carried out thousands of operations uh, during all phases of the disaster. Uh, our operations have ranged from enhancing preparedness for and providing response to geological and hydrometeorological in disaster, like earthquakes, floods, and typhoons to alleviation of racism situations and crisis and conflict context. And we have uh, been setting up base camps, providing medical supplies, logistics, information management support, ICT solutions, etc. And um, furthermore, we also have a long experience in working with mine action, with early recovery and the construction of the critical infrastructure, and from contributing to the software production by capacity development uh, support for our requesting partners. And uh, what regards the staff for waste management specifically, um, and our response, the first mission was the one that I just mentioned, the Kashmir, um, where we were fielded approximately two weeks after the earthquake and started off by doing rapid assessment. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in this occasion, uh, one of the joint environmental units regular staff had actually joined as an index number. So the link to the index was already there from the beginning. Um, and uh, in relation to that mission, uh, MSC actually came back uh, some time later as well uh, to provide support for the South Korean Voice Mansion as part of the recovery work, or the early recovery rather. And then we collaborated uh, both with UNEP and UNDP in a joint project. Uh, so since then, we have also increased our partnership with UNDP and working increasingly with them within this specific sector. Um, I could also say that it was around this time, uh, 2004 to 2005, that uh, the South Korea's management as a concept uh, started to gain recognition globally. And uh, not the least due to the challenges with it after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. Uh, as well as from the experiences from, from the Kashmir earthquake. And, um, well, since then, MSC has learned the huge benefits there are from doing good base work through early and sound south waste assessment. Since this is critical for the planning of an adequate response and recovery, including for the harnessing of necessary funds uh, that are indeed required for any uh, implementation of the South Waste Management of any scale. Great. So it goes back really more than 10, 10 years, you know, 15 years that you've been working on, on this topic. And, and I mean, working with other partners as well, I know that MSB is really considered as a, as a leader in the, in the field uh, related to, to disaster waste management. Um, but if we if we go back now to, you know, the, the UNDAC member, you know, so, okay, so, so why should we care? Actually, what what is the point about disaster waste management? Why why do we care about it? Well, um, um well, uh, disaster waste uh, is um, it's unsafe. It can be unsafe. It can contain hazardous materials, making us immediate risk for already disaster struck communities. And examples can be sharp objects, healthcare waste, assorted household waste, excreta, toxic liquids, gases, and other substances like asbestos, for example. 
And children do, of course, make out a vulnerable group since they tend to spend a lot of time outdoors and close to the ground. And we so have some examples here in this picture. Uh, and apart from putting people at direct risk, the soft waste may also be harmful to the environment by contaminating air, land, and water sources, which in its turn can act as transporters of contaminants to humans leading to secondary hazards, like, for example, cholera outbreaks. And uh, perhaps the worst example is uh, the cholera outbreak uh, after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, where uh, this proportionate large part of the casualties were children, again, one of the most vulnerable groups. And, uh, of course, the longer that the disaster waste remains unattended in tiles or shuffled off the street, the more it tends to rot. And uh, while it can accumulate additional waste, and at the same time as it can attract flies and rodents that can transport contagious diseases and bacteria. And uh, the waste can further also uh, cause blocking and water flow in nearby drainage channels. And that's also, increase the risk for flooding when it rains, and if, if you're unlikely, causing additional secondary hazards. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, unattended waste uh, that is mixed, that's furthermore over the time, become increasingly difficult to separate and, uh, and sort due to that it decomposes, uh, especially when there are new rainfalls coming in. So this makes any reuse or recycling really hard or impossible the longer the, the time pass. Um, waste can also have an impact on livelihoods, for example, if it's less flying on uh, agricultural fields. Uh, it can result in failed crops. Uh, it can have uh, an enormous consequence for people completely depending on it as a livelihood. And uh, after an earthquake, Service from buildings may, as you know, obstruct the entire part of cities and cut off everything. And it may take time to procure and secure the right kind of equipment and tools and resources to handle it. And uh, in the meantime, it's not uh, also uh, certain that it's uh, possible for an untrained eye to tell which other buildings that may be at risk of spontaneous collapse so we're coming back to the aspect that it's good with early assessments. Uh, and in this case, we would need a specific um, skills, uh, infrastructure uh, engineering uh, skills to do the assessment. But uh, we have been collaborating with people with those experts in analysis decisions too. And, um, well, ultimately, unhandled waste and debris of all kinds uh, may, of course, hinder the recovery process by making out the physical uh, impediments for reconstruction of anything from shelter to public infrastructure, uh, as, as well as it may be a psychological impediment affecting people's endeavor to recover and to strive forward. So this is a picture from, uh, from the Philippines after the Haiyan 2014. So those are some pretty complex challenges there and multifaceted issues that you outline and indeed you, you are asking where to start. So what what is MSB's approach uh, to, to this uh, complex uh, challenge and, and, and where do you start and, and what are your ambitions? Uh, ambi ambitions with the work that you're undertaking. Um, well, uh, while we recognize that assessment for early action during the emergency phase is time critical uh, in order to avoid those hazards and secondary hazards that I just mentioned that was caused by the disaster in the short term, we also encourage the concept recovery first. And uh, with this, we mean that in parallel with the relief work, uh, you should have the mindset on how one can prepare, prepare for and contribute to that early and medium term recovery will be as sound and safe as possible. Um, and uh, when it comes to the fast waste management, I would believe that if you just push waste from one place to another uh, without having uh, a real plan for how to handle it, where to handle it, or when to handle it, uh, you may in the end contribute to causing secondary hazards and just push the problem forward. So we therefore see a potential in working towards increased preparedness as well as towards a significantly increase in early collection, sorting, and use and recycling of the software. 
by this, we think that the health risks have been decreased, both in short and medium term, and as well as it may enhance people's ability to return to engage in their ordinary livelihood, or even contribute to the new income opportunities can be generated uh, for few stable cycles, for example. Uh, but not the least, by larger amounts of sources of green debris, like that is for construction materials, for houses, for example. And when a disaster has caused large amounts of building debris, and their demolition works are carried out, uh, the potential for reuse of materials for reconstruction of houses and critical infrastructure is greater yet, provided that there is appropriate equipment made available for it, of course. Um, and uh, increased reuse and recycling of disaster waste and debris can uh, also save money and space compared to land and disposal. Uh, and environmental-wise, an increased sourcing of reuse can obviously also lead to less leakages of, uh, of uh, liquids and pollutants to ground, and then it will then indeed um, decrease the need for catastrophic and burning, and also imply less air pollution. Um, it also should be noted that um, low- and middle-income disaster from countries may have lack its own waste management system. Uh, where large quantities of disaster debris may also fill up the existing disposal site very quickly that may have been challenged already before the disaster, which thus can hamper the already weak waste management system. Uh, all in all, this means that disaster waste management can contribute to recovery back to normal waste management at the same time as we think that it can fill a gap and deficiency that was present even before the disaster struck. And by then attending to this, uh, we work towards what we would call build back better. However, our ability to engage in this uh, depends on our partners. Since MSC's mandate as a national agency is regulated in the sense that we can only act once requested. So we depend on our partners requesting our support. So I don't know, this means that even though we would like to, and we would be ready, ready to take up to the field uh, for persons assessments as soon as we hear of a disaster that has struck, we can't. And uh, it is therefore a continuous challenge and effort of us, of ours, to encourage our partners to call for our support as early as possible. And uh, until we are called upon, we simply have to put our trust to the first responders to prepare for the groundwork for us. Okay, so that of course brings us uh, then to the to the first responders and the, and and that team as, as your partners as well, uh, and um, you know really being there at the first moment of, of response. So just uh, maybe to could you elaborate a little bit? What exactly do you see as the role of the of the ANDAC team in the in first kind of uh, first week in in the role of, of disaster waste management? Well, uh, we believe that ANDAC can contribute enormously by undertaking initial damage and its assessments related to disaster waste and share the information with concerned actors, locally and international actors, as well as with us, which could boost the possibilities for early action on disaster waste management uh, enormously. Uh, if at least we are equipped with good information when we initiate our operations, we can uh, hit the ground running, so to say, and save a lot of time. Uh, time that is precious to the people in the affected area. Uh, and more specifically, uh, I have listed a few points here that uh, uh, we would encourage the team to assess the waste situation at large. And uh, by that I mean assessing uh, the, the geographical spread of the waste, the scale, quantities, what is there and where is it, uh, and uh, more specifically, identify any immediate waste issues that require handling in the short term. For uh, the particular focus here should be on identifying hazardous waste as well as waste that uh, limits humanitarian access. Mm. And if there is an environmental expert on the team, uh, he or she could also support in uh, identifying and specifying what consequences the, the waste may have on humans or on the environment. And uh, we would also encourage, and I, I hope you agree with me, Emilia, that uh, uh, UNDEC team members can also call back for home support, so get some uh, back office support from joint environmental units. Is it, is it so? 
Yeah. Yes, that's true. So we're also here 24-7 to, to help out in, in case there are any questions and to, to link up to experts for sure. That's great. Uh, so, and then uh, to, to assess the local waste management system, my capacity is uh, maybe hard, of course, if you do not have an experience and background in disaster waste management or within environment. Uh, but if you can, or if you have an environmental expert on board, uh, it, it would make a, a huge difference uh, if, if uh, the forthcoming team have some knowledge on what logistics are available, what HR resources are there, what laws and regulations are in place, where are the infrastructural facilities, etc. So, so that's important. And um, as for all emergency response issues of priority, of course, the under team has an important role to play when it comes to identifying needs for additional resources and disaster waste management expertise, not the least, uh, as well as to contribute to the FASHA team by proposing disaster waste management activities and costs. And uh, finally, the under team, uh, we believe that they are instrumental in uh, facilitating information, information exchange and coordination by creating networks and or establishing contacts with two stakeholders, uh, local governments, uh, authorities, and international uh, partners. Uh, and if possible, to identify a focal point for disaster waste management with whom uh, you may connect what's coming to you. And uh, when you leave, uh, do make sure to pass over your findings to uh, those national and international actors taking over and try to connect uh, new teams to the people stakeholders. And uh, yes, please spread the word whenever you can, uh, and also on the possible consequences related to the soft waste management, or to the soft waste rather, when you can. And uh, don't forget to mention that MSD is on standby. That's good to know that there's some additional support available. So if I get you right, and I mean summarize here on the slide as well, it's really, you know, assessing the situation at hand, identifying needs for additional expertise, really working in that kind of information sharing, networking role, making sure that actors working on these issues or coming into the country and wanting to work on these issues, that they are engaged and, and, and get access and know who's doing what where. Um, what do you think uh, are the, the major challenges? You know, why, why is this maybe not always happening? Well, I believe that the time is short, and uh, there are many areas to assess. And there's a huge pressure on the teams, and uh, you have many areas to report uh, on. Uh, so we do understand those limitations. And we're also aware of that while uh, many the teams have uh, environmental experts on board, uh, all do not, and uh, even when they do, it's not necessary that environmental expert uh, has the background of working with disaster waste management specifically, uh, which of course uh, hampers the team's ability to undertake uh, technical assessments within this area. Um, so, so yeah, those, those uh, I believe are challenges that uh, uh, we try to see it uh, on the bright side as well. And as I understand it, there are ongoing efforts to increase the capacities within the environment and the waste management uh, within the existing UNVIC uh, members uh, through uh, uh, training uh, in environments and emergencies, including trainings on the disaster waste management. And um, I hope that this could have a catalytic effect. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, Emilia can tell you more about that and also about the advocacy work for potential requesting partners. Uh, and by that I mean the UN country offices, and more specifically, the designated UN resident coordinators in uh, disaster prone countries. Uh, so, I mean, uh, advocacy to encourage them to, in their request for UNVIC team support, also highlight the need for inclusion of environmental expertise, and uh, perhaps specifically with expertise in disaster waste management. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true that it's, uh, it's a lot about, um, and I think that we try to reinforce in the trainings as well, you know, just kind of to raise the flag so that people know that it's there and, and these expertise exists and, and, and also just try to, to keep that, you know, kind of general awareness on, on the topic. And advocacy is indeed one thing that, that gets emphasized quite a lot as well in terms of partners. 
Um, maybe you can still expand a little bit on, on the role of, of the ONDAC team in terms of, of information sharing and, and coordination. Um, may, yeah, how do you think that that uh, should happen in, in practice? Um, well, uh, as you know, information management and coordination is always somewhat of a challenge in a post disaster scene, and more so when it comes to uh, a sector like disaster waste management that is perhaps not always at the top of the priority list. Um, for example, when the cluster system is activated a few weeks later normally, uh, uh, it, um, it, it tends to fall between the chairs. Uh, it could uh, fall within the early recovery cluster as well, uh, that may be activated late or maybe not at all. Uh, uh, for as there, is, uh, there normally is a lack of coordination between the different clusters of concern. Uh, but by coming back to the point previously mentioned regarding the potential that unit teams have in early communication of the fast waste management needs, um, you have the OSAC hub which is uh, your, your key platform for it. And since it's attended by national authorities of concern and key humanitarian experts, including the UN resident coordinator, uh, this, uh, this give, gives you uh, a window of opportunity that you can't uh, afford to, to miss. Um, and so given the central place that you have in the initial coordination phase, um, you, you have a good, really good chance here to highlight the, the, the key concerns. So um, I would say that apart from communicating which roads are blocked by debris or wherever are temporary dumps piled up, the teams could as well, uh, to the extent possible, catch the opportunity here to reinforce the need for local authorities to take on a collective approach uh, to the software waste management in order to avoid any immediate secondary hazards and in order to enhance sound recovery in the intermediate term. Uh, so the other team could, for example, in this forum propose that a team of the uh, disaster risk management experts should be requested immediately to, together with relevant authorities, undertake a proper needs assessment and cost estimate for the necessary disaster risk management actions. Uh, and also, having the ambition to have something substantial at hand when the time comes uh, to produce the flash appeal. Uh, of course, uh, allocated funds from the flash appeal uh, are key to attain earmarked funds for disaster waste management. Uh, and the funds would, uh, in most cases, strongly contribute to a more efficient work to be carried out by the disaster waste management team and its partners afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's also what we have noticed that uh, indeed the ONDAC team is, is there very early on and they are key in, in requesting additional expertise because if it's not done in those very few, you know, early days of, of a response, then it, it usually kind of falls to, through the cracks, as you say. So things have to be flagged very early on and it also, of course, applies to the partners who might be interested in, in sending out in additional expertise. They are interested to do so while the, the disaster is still kind of fresh in, in the minds of everyone. And then if the request comes in, you know, too late, a month into the disaster, then it's usually always always too too late. Um, so maybe maybe still I'd like to ask you your what do you feel about the, the role of the humanitarian the international community still in, in advocating for these issues and kind of raising awareness, you know. What else can we do? I think it's you, you elaborated quite nicely on, on what the role is in the actual response, but, but what is there you know, what else can we do to, to raise awareness uh, to this issue? Um, well there is a need to encourage the humanitarian community to include the disaster waste management aspect in all phases of humanitarian action. Uh, from the response to early recovery and recovery towards long-term development, uh, including strategic planning, prevention and preparedness, as well as in monitoring and evaluation of progress. And uh, once there is a stronger demand for disaster waste management within the humanitarian community, it could hopefully also contribute to more resources for it. And um, a direct way to encourage some of the key actors in, the, in this is to approach different clusters, I think, and uh, communicate the need to integrate challenges to soft waste and opportunities with it, or the challenges with waste and opportunities with management of it. Uh, and we have uh, within ourselves, as you know, Amelia, 
uh, with Brenda Magnus and Williams and other stakeholders previously discussed the possibility of creating a specific task force uh, for the task force management within the existing cluster system and possibly under the, uh, the current environment and humanitarian action network or under the early recovery or wash clusters. Uh, so this is a key task that we need to pick up upon and to plan for. Uh, ho hopefully it can work out and have an impact. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about preparedness. Uh, since some, since some uh, optimal disaster response, of course, requires good planning and coordination ahead of the disaster event. Uh, I would specifically highlight the need for better preparedness, um, which could be considered at all levels, from local and national to international. And um, obviously, this is a challenge, uh, and it's particularly important in disaster prone countries, where many of them have weak and underfunded waste management systems already. Uh, so, understandably, it's hard to convince responsible authorities to invest in preparedness measures uh, for the future when resources are scarce already for daily operations. But um, in this, uh, the humanitarian community could play a role in uh, supporting in terms of forcing funding through its channels and support capacities uh, and capacitate uh, authorities and disaster uh, response organizations. Uh, in conducting pre-disaster planning and incorporating disaster waste management in emergency preparedness and waste management plans, uh, as well as uh, it could be incorporated in their standard operating procedures. And uh, we could also help by encouraging nations and authorities to seek support uh, specifically regarding disaster waste management preparedness and inform them about funding calls and enforcing channels and opportunities as we come to hear them. Um, and for, for uh, on behalf of NSG, of course, uh, it, it fits very well uh, into our mandate of being an actor that can engage throughout the disaster continuum, and it could also relate to our work with catastrophe development and disaster production. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, that's, that's what I would propose. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And actually, uh, we have also colleagues working in, in UN environments. I know in the in the Asia region, uh, they just started a new project dealing with uh, disaster waste management, where they are specifically looking to bring in uh, the environment community and the emergency managers to see how you can include disaster waste management in the solid waste management plans and, and vice versa, that you get the solid waste managers and, and the waste experts into the, the disaster preparedness and contingency planning and so on. So you make sure that you link these actors up in advance already before a disaster strikes. So I think that's also quite interesting work that's being done kind of on, uh, the, in the development uh, community. Uh, so finally, maybe uh, a question, Camilla, so you've been working in this field for quite some time now, and you have uh, seen a lot of different disasters and deployed lots of experts. Uh, so do you have any, you know, success stories or best uh, examples that you can share with us, you know, like uh, where did we really make a difference and what was the case and, and what can we learn for it, from it? Um, yes, um, uh, I would then mention our response after the tropical cyclone time in Vanuatu in 2015 and uh, the response after Typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan in the Philippines uh, uh, where we were engaged in 2014. And uh, uh, in Vanuatu, we uh, arrived within 10 days and we had one expert uh, seen that. Uh, and that expert uh, supported in undertaking, uh, supporting in the case, we were requested by UNDP, uh, to undertake rapid assessment analysis for the disaster waste management needs, uh, which was done quite efficiently and resulted in uh, speedy inputs to program uh, strategies and recovery plans on the disaster management. And it comprised everything from strategic planning to resource mobilization, planning, and upstarting of um, concrete uh, actions and uh, projects. And um, uh, the picture shows an example of one of those projects uh, about uh, reusing green debris uh, as construction material. Um, and some lessons learned from that uh, uh, discussion is that even though we arrived early, uh, and even early deployments uh, should have been even better, of course. This is always the case. 
uh, um, the silver dam have been able to more effectively um, be able to start early intervention. And we would also have had a greater possibility to secure a bigger contribution from donors. So time passes quickly, and uh, every day is important. And um, um, yeah, we could we could uh, have benefited enormously also by having sent two experts at the same time. Uh, it was uh, hard to um, to uh, the short notes here, uh, but um, that would have uh, enabled uh, even better assessments, uh, technical assessments. Uh, as well as it, ha it could have at the same time provided the necessary support to UNDP in terms of uh, uh, doing project and budget proposals. Uh, and there was also uh, too little time available for the experts to lobby effectively with donors in the early days, which is really critical. Uh, so this is a lesson learned not only from this commission but from, from others that uh, we should always have at least two people deployed at the same time because the situation is normally complex and often needs to be both in the field and then need to come to meetings and communication uh, meetings, uh, meetings and justice. Um, another lesson learned from this mission was that the cooperation and partnership with local authorities was really crucial and uh, worked really well um, as the local government entities took an um, important role in dealing with the beneficiaries. Uh, as well as coordinating with uh, relevant partners. Um, and uh, the last that we learned would be uh, the cash for work. Uh, gates that were set up, that uh, even though it is uh, questioned, and of course it's not a proper source of in income, the cash they receive during cash for work, but uh, in this case, it was one of the cases where it was very clear that um, apart from them just getting some cash, it contributed to the recovery process in the sense that people really use the cash uh, to buy construction material or housing that repair. So um, uh, all in all, it was a short and quite efficient measure. And uh, then the next one uh, that I will talk about is uh, uh, the disaster waste management mission that we had in Philippines after Typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan. Uh, this is one of our uh, bigger disaster waste management sessions uh, where we provide the support in several, area, several areas. Uh, everything from providing heavy equipment, heavy clearance, uh, uh, construction of temporary dump sites, uh, construction of interim dump sites, improvement of uh, dump sites and landfills, uh, site search for permanent uh, controlled dump sites, support for healthcare waste, support in handling it, uh, heavy equipment, uh, support uh, demolition works, uh, and the most least capacity building, capacity development, and support for the creation of uh, livelihoods. And uh, well, in this case, we arrived uh, with a team uh, about two months after the typhoon. Uh, and um, the mission was initiated uh, by a close contact with the search team, uh, which I think was contributing uh, to it starting off uh, quite efficiently. Uh, since the team got good uh, contacts and information on where to focus, where to concentrate the assessment, uh, and, and who to contact with. And um, um, well, a lesson learned from here uh, is that uh, with regards to assessments, it's not enough to only do them once. You rather need to do them continuously at least twice, uh, after an arrival and then after a few weeks or a month or, two, or, a month or two again. And uh, when undertaking assessments, you need to also be clear uh, with the, what budget you have available so you know uh, what you can do and uh, how much it's worthwhile to, to assess and what to focus on. And, uh, of course, um, the contact with local authorities is key also while you undertake the assessment. Um, cost procurement of heavy equipment contractors um, was the, we learned the hard way here that it's really necessary and it can take much longer time than you anticipate and it's something that you need to start really early uh, to make sure that you will have it at hand when you need it. Um, 
um, it was learned that the uh, mapping of uh, critical infrastructure, infrastructure and entities that may contain hazardous material is important. It's not always the case that it's done, but it's really important to know uh, what um, uh, products and uh, substances may exist in different kind of entities. And um, it's really important to have an X strategy uh, prepared so that you know how to hand over when you finalize your job. Uh, and uh, one of the key working methods here was working shoulder to shoulder with your local partner, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the most efficient ways to build capacity. And uh, on this picture, um, it was a, 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 a means to um, to show how how it looks like from the beginning on the left hand side in one of the band sites as compared to how the sorting, for example, was, uh, was facilitated uh, uh, after the project ended. Uh, a much more safer environment and much more control for the, the waste workers. Uh, also, uh, it didn't allow kids to come into the area like before. And on the right side, the, the picture of the drive is uh, uh, when uh, the, the team is um, taking out a local authority um, to, to, to show them what they're doing and uh, giving them support and advice as they, as they went along. Good. So that's, uh, that's quite impressive, then, the, the differences that you can make if you send in a, a couple of people and you have time to, to work on this more, more long term. Uh, just to, to, to wrap up kind of our conversation here, I mean, um, very interesting examples also from the, from the field. Maybe you have, like, just the, well, any final pieces of advice for the, from the, for the listeners before we hand over to them for some questions and comments. Uh, yes. Well, here they are. Oh, awesome. Be open and flexible and use any advice and material on the task of waste management and environmental competence available or uh, seek additional information or get back of the support. And do like the national and international stakeholders from day one. And uh, Keep in mind that your assessment on the task of waste management can really make a difference for the people that have been affected by the disaster. Great. Sounds very good. Okay, so I will um, uh, hand over now to our listeners. So please uh, do raise your hands uh, using the little raise your hand button or type your questions. Uh, I'll hand over to you in case you have your audio connected. If you don't have your audio connected, just type your questions and we'll pick it up from here. So, are there any any questions? Um, I am looking. Danny, Danny D. Danilo, sorry, communication issues. Danilo, please, over to you. I'm handing over to you for the question. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. Sorry, I have to turn off the video because connection wasn't that good. Let's see if I managed to, to put the video back again so you can see me as well. Um, At least we can hear you, so you can maybe ask your question and then we can... Okay, ask. yeah, sorry. Um, here we are. Hi. Good afternoon. And sorry, I joined a bit uh, um, late, sorry for that, uh, was dealing with some issues here in the office. But um, my question... Uh, concerns the, the management of robots. Uh, here in Italy during our, uh, most recent earthquake in central Italy, we had a big issue with, uh, uh robots management. <laughs> Due to the quantity of robots and the need to, to store them in a short period of time, 
Uh, have you ever had to cope with such an issue in uh, in your experience? And uh, um, what is uh, uh, what is your opinion with regard to the robots management in developing countries instead? Uh, is it? I, I guess it's problematic as well. Um, can UNDAC team um, somehow uh, advise local authorities on that, uh, or it, it is uh, rather a uh, long-term issue with which uh, UNDAC teams are not able to, to, to deal? And uh, thank you, thank you for, for, for the input you gave us this afternoon. Back to you. Okay, so thanks so much, Danilo. So the question is for you, Camilla, on, on rubble management. How do you deal with that, and, and uh, how do you advise the national authorities on, on that issue? Over to you. Well, um, you asked what, what should the UNDEC team do, and um, I mean, I, I haven't had a, a managed a, a mission with an UNDEC team as such, uh, and, uh, but in our missions, when we have deployed MSD experts, uh, they have indeed uh, engaged very closely with local authorities uh, through the UNDP in handling the rubble. And uh, the, the, the principle has been that uh, you, um, you demolish uh, uh, unsafe structures as, as soon as you can, uh, manually if possible, since this is the quickest, and as long as it is safe. And uh, otherwise, you will use machinery. But uh, until you have the appropriate machinery there, you will have to um, to protect the area to avoid any any further accidents. Uh, but then, uh, once we have uh, uh, a lot of rubble uh, on the ground burning the building, uh, we we would uh, typically encourage uh, sorting uh, of the rubble on the site as close to it as possible, so that we can also. Uh, enable uh, reutilization of the material. Uh, but everything regarding uh, demolition management and uh, management of the debris and the reconstruction of it uh, is something that we have learned from experience that it has to be really, really closely handled with the local authorities because we need to uh, uh, know exactly um, who to go through, what permissions you need, uh, in what order you should do what. Um, and uh, it, there may be some um, legal hinders uh, stopping you from uh, doing something that you perhaps as a, as a humanitarian actor think is, is uh, necessary, but still you will have to wait because you will need to adjust to, to uh, rules and regulations. But so just, just cooperation with uh, the local uh, government, and uh, that, will be, uh, that will be valid for the United teams as well, of course. But then... Uh, this is a complex issue, so again, uh, you would uh, probably do best in calling in for additional experts to, to help out in this, to do assessments and to handle it. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for, for that reply. Then we have a question uh, from uh, Ramesh in uh, Nepal. Over to you, Ramesh. Um, so, Ramesh, uh, can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you, actually. Hello. Yes, now we can hear you. If you, it's a bit weak though, so speak up or closer to the mic. Yes, I'm from Nepal. And, and uh, I'm working at an one NGO currently in Nepal. And it is working with UNEP for disaster waste management as well as the GNH Action. Uh, and my question is, here in the presentation, you have the presentation here, uh, you have included only the waste generated from the earthquake. Uh, only, I think most of the speakers and the team were related to the earthquake. And my point is, there are other disasters related to other waste generated from the other disasters like flood, uh, fire. Uh, so my point is, I think we should incorporate this waste and in Nepal. Uh, we have seen the disastrous uh, flood recently and huge waste generation as well. So I think you know, we need to talk about uh, that also and uh, uh, we need to work to mitigate that impact. Thank you. Yeah. 
I can't hear you. Sorry oh. about that. Okay. I unmuted myself. I unmuted myself by mistake. Uh, so that was a valid comment uh, from uh, from uh, Amesh working on uh, in the lead in Nepal, which is an NGO working also on disaster waste management, pointing out that you know many of the pictures we saw were earthquake generated waste, but of course different types of disasters give uh, rise to different types of waste. So, for example, now in Nepal they have experiences with waste generated by by floods. And also, we should look into the mitigation of, of these different uh, types of, of waste in terms of preparedness actions. So maybe you can comment on, on that, uh, Camilla. So I can only uh, fully agree. And uh, uh, our approach is to use the concept of disaster waste management. And, and within that, we would like to include any kind of waste management, ranging from management of household waste, uh, municipal waste, industrial waste, uh, healthcare waste. And uh, uh, that is in rubble uh, from uh, buildings and, and infrastructure. So, so uh, yes, we should definitely have the same approach and uh, enhance the preparedness uh, for all kinds of waste. Thank you. Um, okay, are there any other questions from uh, from the participants? Ah, oh, Anna Fonseca, whom we know quite well. Over to you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I don't know if you hear me. I hear you. Uh, it's just a comment. I want to make a comment in terms of um, how I was listening to how you say how you said, Canada, that the UNDOC, and in terms of um, passing through the information for the experts to that are arriving on the ground. Uh, I think it's very important, and I had that experience uh, in uh, Ecuador. And I was able to, to link with the person that was there from UNDAC. And fortunately, he gave me all the intel, if I can say that, in terms of the, the key points that I should look and the key contacts that I should talk to. Uh, and that makes, that made the, the assessments easier and quicker because everything was, uh, as you know, when we arrive on the ground, everything is, needs to be very, very quick and well done. Um, so I think it's crucial, if I can say, that uh, if we have that information, even if we know that we are going to be deployed and if we, if we know someone on the UNDAC team that can pass that information to us or if we can go uh, soon enough to the field and contact them directly there, I think that, that would be the, the best scenario. Uh, it's very important for the ones that are deployed to have the information from the early assessments in order to know what was, what happened in terms of uh, what was the situation when they arrived and what, what is the situation when you arrive and what actually can you do and how can you make a difference. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a valid point and I'm commenting here as well in terms of uh, from the joint unit perspective because of course, the environmental expert in that case uh, uh, was sent out as, as part of the UNDAC team, an associate expert. He did not have particular disaster waste experience, but because he was there and the first on the ground, he was asked by the authorities to quite quickly provide some very rapid advice in terms of temporary dump sites, in terms of hazardous waste, uh, some of the the rubble, you know, where to put it, what to do with it. And he was, you know, environmental expert enough to be able to kind of answer those questions. And then, of course, the, the network that we have with the, with the joint unit and, and with, you know, working in, in partnership with MSB and the others, we knew that there were people coming in. So then we were able to, to put them in touch with, with that uh, environmental expert before he left. And so, so I think those, those types of, of things are also very, very valuable because you can pass over so much information just, you know, in, in a 30 minute uh, conversation or, or a call when you're, when you're there on the ground versus what a person can receive if they're trying to, you know, just read from secrets or, or go online. So I think that's also very valuable. I think we are uh, running out of time or, you know, about to, to wrap up here. So if there are any final questions, uh, we could still take one. But I don't see anyone raising their hand. Otherwise, you can speak without me giving you the, <laughs> giving you the, the, the right to do so. No? Okay. 
Well, in that case, um, thank you so much, Camila, for, for spending time with us today.